Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing with our series Doubting Philosophical Distinctions, Necessary, A Priori, Analytic, and Where They Fall Apart with Kant, Kripke, and Quine. In this video we're going to be looking at Quine's demonstration of the circularity of analyticity. So, broadly, Willard Van Orman Quine published what is arguably the single most influential philosophy article of the 20th century, Two Dogmas of Empiricism. A complete explanation of this piece and its influence on philosophy will need to await another video. Here we're going to be focusing just on Quine's concern about the circularity of the concept of analyticity. That was one of the two dogmas he was talking about, the idea of the analytic-synthetic distinction. Basically, Quine demonstrates that the concept of analyticity cannot be defined without reference back to analyticity itself. If this concept can only be defined circularly, then it's not really defined. If I tell you that sidfus means sidfus, then I've not really told you anything about the concept because I used that word in my definition for that word. So if we can only define something circularly, we probably don't want it in our ontology. Now, with that said, let's dig into the actual argument. Analytic statements are often described as statements which are true by definition, or based on the meaning of the terms alone. The issue, according to Quine, is that this idea of meaning is not sufficiently clear. He demonstrates that this by reference to the difference between extension and intention. Check out my video on the difference between extension and intention if you're confused here. Simply because two different terms have the same extension, as in they refer to the same thing in the world, does not imply that they have the same intention, the way that they refer to that thing in the world. He uses the example of all things with hearts and all things with kidneys. Since they have the same extension, all things with a heart happen to be have a kidney in the world, and all things with kidneys happen to have a heart in the world, but clearly have different meanings. So extension and meaning don't perfectly map onto each other. But neither does intention, because I can say two things in different ways, but actually mean the same thing. With that in hand, let's move on to a definition of analyticity. Quine makes the distinction between statements that are analytic based on their logical structure, and therefore just necessary, e.g. all x or x, no x or non-x, where x is some referring term, such as all mice are mice, no birds are non-birds. So those kinds of statements, and statements which must use some notion of synonymy to become those of the first category. All x or y, where y is a synonym for x. And we can just replace the y in the first statement with x to arrive at our clearly, logically true statements in the first half. All teachers or educators can be reduced to all teachers or teachers by replacing educators with the synonym teachers. Quine is concerned about the second type of statement, as synonym is really problematic to define. And if we can't have the second type of statement, all we're really talking about is logical truths when we talk about analyticity. And that means that this is a much different distinction than we originally thought of, and we could probably wrap it up just in the idea of a logical truth. So in order for analyticity to really have the punch that it's supposed to have, we need a definition of synonymy. What makes two words synonymous? Quine goes on to offer several possible definitions of synonymy and analyticity, therefore, all of which he finds wanting. First, he looks at equating synonymy with the definition, with just definition or abbreviation. By convention, basically, when I say 27 or 27, one is simply an abbreviation of the other. However, this has not really defined the term. Just because I say, oh, by 27, I mean 27, one is the number, one is spelled out. I haven't told you what I mean when I say that. I've just given you something that also refers to that. The idea of a definition rests on the claim that the two terms have the same meaning, but not that they're that way just by fiat or convention. By saying that one thing actually means another thing, that I'm actually learning something. When I say that when I say bachelor, I mean unmarried man. There's something more. We're talking about separate concepts being someone that is unmarried and someone that is male when we say the word bachelor. That's not just by convention. There's an idea contained in the word bachelor. 
This idea of the same meaning is the very notion of synonymy that we're trying to define. So this is problematic. Basically, what he's just trying to discard here is saying that we can't just refer to, oh, this is just replacing this thing in a particular situation. We have to have a deeper idea of meaning. As the earlier example relating to extensions versus intentions demonstrated, we can't simply claim that synonymy can be grounded in two terms picking out the same members in the world. Trilateral, having three sides, and triangular, having three angles, pick out the same things in the world, namely triangles, but they mean different things and are not synonymous. The same goes for has a heart and has a kidney. Just because something picks out the same objects in the world doesn't mean that it means the same thing in the way that bachelor and unmarried man mean the same thing. This becomes clear when we look at another possible definition of synonymy, that two terms can be exchanged in a sentence, salva veritate, saving truth value while preserving the same truth value. So if it was true before, it should be true after, it was false before, it should be false after, exchanging the terms. However, this has a sense and reference problem as well. Well, we might be able to replace widower with man whose spouse has died in the statement, that was the day Bubakar became a widower. That was the day Bubakar became a man whose spouse had died. Should have the same truth value no matter what. While maintaining the same truth value, we can't do the same for the following statement. The word widower has seven letters. Therefore, interchangeability can't be what we mean by synonymy either. What we're really looking for, according to Quine, isn't just this sense of synonymy in terms of linguistic interchangeability, but something like cognitive synonymy, that they're the same in our minds or the way that we conceive of them, not just that we can replace them in a particular sentence. But this is really elusive to find. We can't define it as two words with the same extension, that's the has a heart, has a kidney problem, nor can we use words that are replicable salva veritate, bachelor having eight letters, and so on. But maybe we can define it in terms of necessity. So imagine that we have a system that already has the idea of necessity in place. Some term X can be defined as some other term Y. Necessarily, X is and only is Y. A brother is defined as a male sibling if and only if necessarily a brother is and only is a male sibling. This resolves the issue of having a heart and a kidney, since while in this world they are always coextended, it does not follow that they logically must be in all possible worlds. Now there's a couple issues with that. The idea of using necessity may seem promising, but the issue here is that in order to find necessity here, or necessary, we need to rely on the very term we were trying to define, analyticity. What makes necessarily all brothers are brothers true, is that it is a logical truth. To conclude from this that necessarily all brothers are male siblings, we must have some notion of allowing us to you to replace terms which are cognitively synonymous. But that's the very term we were trying to define. This takes us back to the drawing board. There's also some issues around, well, what about triangular and trilateral? Because that's going to be a logical truth that all things that are triangular are trilateral, but they don't mean the same thing. One means has three sides and one means has three angles. Those aren't the same thing. And so even this is going to be a little concerning. Finally, Quine considers the possibility that analyticity is not defined as a rule, but rather as a long disjunction of all the statements which are analytic. We just have a pile of statements and we say by convention or fiat that these are analytic, any ones that don't fit in that are not analytic. In other words, we don't state what it means, but rather just list all analytic statements. The issue here is that we don't have any way of determining if we have the right list or critiquing that list, since there is nothing in virtue of which a particular statement is included, because if there were, we would actually have a definition of analyticity. Without a decision criterion, we have no way of determining what belongs in the category and what does not, other than just believing someone that's like, yeah, that sounds analytic. This issue is similar to the problem of the criterion in epistemology. Check out my video on the problem of criterion for more on that. From all of this, Quine concludes that any definition of analytic is necessarily circular, and we should drop the term altogether. While there have been others 
after Quine, who have critiqued this argument from a neo-Cartesian or externalist viewpoint, the original logical positivist conception of the analytic is widely considered dead due to this paper, Two Dogmas of Empiricism. It's available online for free if you want to check it out. In the future, hopefully, we'll do another video working more broadly with the paper and talking about Quine's bigger project against the logical positivists. What do you think? Can we define analyticity in a non-circular way? If you think we can, offer your definition in the comments below and go out and debate if you think we can't anyone that offers such a definition. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org. We're going to be doing another video in this series. Next up, we're going to be looking at Kripke. We're going to do two videos on Kripke uh, with necessary a posteriori statements and contingent a priori statements um, to finish out this series. Stay skeptical, everybody.